Let us pray. Mm -hmm. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. I am the resurrection and the life. I have a question to pose to you. When Lazarus died, where did he go? I wonder if you've, you know, spent many years in the church and heard the story of Lazarus many a time. Have you ever asked the question, when he died, where did he go? And hence, where did he come back from? Because there are various answers. Maybe he didn't go anywhere. There's some discussion in the literature uh, that the reason that uh, it talks about four days is that there was a cultural understanding that when one, someone died, they hung around for a while. <laughs> and, uh, but four days was enough to make sure that they'd gone. <laughs> um, but we tend as Christians to think when someone dies, someone beloved of Christ, that they would go to heaven. So why would you want to come back? I, get it. I just want you to ponder that for a while, okay? Again and again, my experience is that we human beings, when we want to bring things down to their core about the meaning and the important things of life, again and again, the answer seems to be the most important and treasured thing are our relationships. I mean, there's this typical response uh, when people think about their funeral. They go, when I get to my funeral, I don't want the story to be about how much time I spent at work. I want it to be about the relationships I shared. Once again, at funerals, when, when people are looking for comfort in this time of mourning, what do they often point towards? They'll often point towards the idea that the deceased person is now back in relationship with others that they have loved that have died before them. When we sat in our own houses during COVID, what was the one thing that it made clear to us that we missed the most? Our relationships. Thank you. I like, I like a good yelling out from the congregation. Well done, whoever that was. It's been my contention for a period of time that we need to recognise at the heart of what we do, at the heart of how we proclaim good news, should be the quality of our relationships. Relationships that transform us and others. I've described it as being with, being with God, being with each other, and being with the community around us. So we've been going on this journey for a period of time now. We've been going on this journey 
for which I've been suggesting to you we are preparing for the events of Easter. And we enter into the stories, particularly of John, to do so. So we first heard about the temptations of Jesus in the desert. And we came to understand that symbolically this was expressing at the beginning of Matthew's Gospel the idea that of what will turn out in the end. That as Jesus faces the uh, cosmic reality of evil and chaos, Jesus overcomes it. We've then heard stories about Nicodemus, about the woman at the well, the man born blind, and today Lazarus, Mary and Martha. We've heard in each story there being a dichotomy. Are you born again or born from above? Are you drinking stale water or living water? Do you see or are you blind? Do you walk during the day or at night? And in today's gospel, Jesus says, our friend has fallen asleep, but we're going to wake him. Every single time Jesus does this, those who are listening get it wrong. But it's the ones that eventually get it right that seem to be transformed and changed for the abundant life that God promises. It's clear in this which is kind of the last sign in John's Gospel before the events of Easter that the metaphor hits us in the face because this becomes death and life. Life which is understood as coming through Christ I am the resurrection and the life. <laughs> I have come that they should have life and have it abundantly. I want to say more about this story. What is the final sign in John's Gospel before the events of death and resurrection? I want you to understand that the connection between this story and the events of Easter are inextricably linked. Just think about the things that are similar. There is a dead person. Yeah. That dead person rises. When that dead person rises, there are grave clothes. For Lazarus, still on him. For Jesus, folded up in the corner. Someone asks, where have you laid the dead person? Jesus, in this case, Mary Magdalene, on the morning of resurrection. There is a tomb. There is a stone. A stone needs to be rolled away. Do you think this is coincidence? One of the most fascinating things about this that I think is insightful to how we should understand the events of resurrection morning is that Jesus says, roll away the stone. And Martha says, mate, he's been dead four days. It's going to stink. What does Jesus say? Do you believe? Well, if you believe, as this tomb is opened and you look in, you will see the glory of God. So what do you think we're supposed to do on Easter morning when the stone's rolled away and the tomb is empty and we look in? We see the glory of God. Okay. Generally during this time, I have sought to take one of the characters within the narrative and try to look at the relationship that is between them and Jesus and see how that relationship changes them, shapes them. So let's have a look at Lazarus today. Let's have a look at the character of Lazarus. I...
Where else in Scripture do we meet Lazarus? Not a rhetorical question. Any answers? Where else? The answer is nowhere else. There is a Lazarus mentioned in a, in a parable, not this Lazarus. How much is this most important thinker mentioned in John's Gospel? It's kind of present for two chapters. The one we're reading today and the next one. Actually, it says a certain man. That's how it starts. This is the first time Lazarus has been introduced. What do we know about Lazarus? Well, the amazing thing about this passage is it's perhaps the most relational and emotive so far in John's Gospel. Because it keeps on saying, you know, uh, a message came to Jesus that the that whom he loved was sick. Jesus says we need to go to Judea because our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep. He arrives and it says uh, that he greets Martha and it says the one who, the ones who Jesus loved, Martha Mary, Lazarus. It says it again. And then, at the point of time where Jesus comes to the tomb and he sees the deep grief of those he loves, Mary and Martha, and those who are weeping around him, it says Jesus wept. And then it says, and those who saw it said, how, see how much he loved him. Okay? It's clear that the author of John's Gospel wants us to understand Lazarus as beloved. Okay. I wonder of the biblical scholars in the congregation here today, many of you will be aware in John's Gospel that suddenly a new character appears at the Last Supper. Not mentioned before anywhere in John's Gospel. We tend to call this character the beloved disciple. He's then mentioned again and again in John's Gospel until the end. He reclines against Jesus at the Last Supper. He follows Jesus uh, with Peter to the temple where he's able to follow Jesus into the court where Jesus is being tried by the priests. He's there at the foot of the cross when all the other disciples have abandoned Jesus except the women. And Jesus says to the beloved disciple, here is your mother. And to his mother, here is your son. He is there to witness the empty tomb as after Mary Magdalene uh, alerts Peter and the beloved disciple to the tomb being empty, he runs with Peter to the tomb. You know, and, and one of the key parts of that is that the beloved disciple gets there first and peers in. Doesn't go in, peers in. And Peter runs in and goes in. What were we told about peering into Lazarus' tomb? Here you will see the glory of God, if you believe. In John's Gospel, it says the beloved disciple peers into the tomb and he believed. He then appears uh, uh, with the disciples as Jesus, in John's Gospel's 
commissions them by breathing the Holy Spirit on them and says, uh, as God had sent me, I send you. Sorry, it keeps on going, I'm sorry. <laughs> he then um, appears with Peter in the boat fishing. When Jesus appears on the shore, and he's the first to go, hey, wait, that's Jesus. He's the first to recognize Jesus. Almost there. Then when Jesus, with Peter, tells Peter that how he will be dragged out and killed, Peter says, well, what about this bloke? And Jesus says, what's that got to do with you? If he remains until I come. The rumour is, he will not die. Finally, at the last couple of lines of John's Gospel, it says, the one who is testifying to you in this book is the beloved disciple. I reckon the beloved disciple is Lazarus. There's no one else, except for Mary and Martha, who Jesus is, where we hear explicitly it says that they are beloved, loved by Jesus. We know that Jesus loves people, but explicitly. So when it gets to the Last Supper and it says, this is the beloved disciple, well, I think the connection's strong. John has this habit. You think in John's Gospel where it's, it names the signs. It says, you know, the turning of the water and the wine is the first sign. I can't remember what the second one is, but anyway, it names it as the second one. And then it stops naming them. You've got to work it out. He's done the same thing. This is Lazarus. He is beloved. Does it a number of times. And then he stops telling you it's Lazarus. I want to suggest to you that Lazarus becomes, in this gospel, that which represents what true discipleship looks like. And here's the connection. John's Gospel does say that God loves others. Who? For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that who should ever believe in him should not perish but have eternal life. Here we go again. Life, life in the full, life in abundance. Believe. I want to remind you, you that in John's Gospel, believe does not mean rational assent. Believe means that you're willing to live your life according to the relationship that you have with God in Jesus Christ. Belief means not, I can quote the creeds well. It means, as I live my life, it reveals Christ. I want to suggest to you uh, that the reason Lazarus comes back is for relationship. And because of relationship, because in these relationships... God's love that is found in Jesus Christ, that is achieved through death and resurrection, is revealed. Lazarus, who has gone from death to life, becomes a witness, a, a testimony to who Jesus is. We see that in this, he has found deep relationship with God through Christ, which is exemplified by the fact that the Last Supper, he reclines on Jesus. That's pretty intimate. He becomes a, a, a member 
of the family of God. So much so that Jesus says, this is your mother. This is your son. He is a witness to the empty tomb. He understands that when Jesus breathes on them, he says that our job is the same as that which Jesus was. I send you as God has sent me. And on the beach, it's the beloved disciple that goes, actually, that's God, that's Jesus over there. He's the one who recognises where God is acting in Jesus and is able to point towards it and point others towards it. He's the one who wrote the gospel and testified to all that has happened. Maybe. That's my argument anyway. And I have some backing for that. Lazarus returns for relationship. Relationship that reveals God and exemplifies to us that we are called to be people who move in baptism from death to life. To be people who, in our witness to the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, might be like the disciples who have been commissioned by Jesus, as God has sent me, I send you. So that we, in our lives, in our church, in our relationships, might be the ones that are able to see where God is acting in the world and say, that is God in Jesus Christ. When we celebrate Easter, we are celebrating the action of God who renews the relationship between us and God, us and each other, and us in the world. God does for us what we cannot do for ourselves in re-establishing the relationships in which we are born from above, in which we drink of living water, in which we see, in which we walk in the day, in which we are awake, in which we come to know abundant life. The question will be for us when we get to Easter, how will we respond? Will we believe? And by belief, I mean will our lives, our relationships, our choices and actions be consistent with what Jesus has done? So that the life that God has intended might be lived and revealed in the here and the now. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the resurrection and the life. In the name of God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Amen.